Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Ashbourne Oxford Programme webinar. Uh, my name is Will Stockland. I am the Principal Oxbridge Coordinator. I'm also Head of Faculty of Culture and Society, and I'm also Head of History of Art. So we have a, uh, a designated uh, programme uh, at Ashbourne to support uh, students that are making it an Oxbridge programme. So I think in the first instance, it's important to go through some points about uh, Oxford and Cambridge in terms of what is it that is so distinct and different about Oxford and Cambridge um, and um, that requires uh, a designated programme to support students in making their applications? So I think that, that, that's, very, that's very important that we get a good understanding of uh, why the Oxbridge programme exists in the first place. So the first uh, key point to make about Oxford and Cambridge in relation to their distinctness from other British universities, I think that's the key thing, is, is their academic ranking. So in terms of their uh, academic research output, in terms of the uh, quality of research publications that are produced at the university, in terms of the quality of academic teaching, um, so all aspects of uh, the, the, the universities in terms of their academic quality, they are um, ranked uh, significantly higher than um, other British universities across the board. So that, that's an important point to make, and I'll go into that uh, in a bit more detail in a minute, that their overall uh, ranking across all their subjects is is higher. Now, um, we generally, in terms of looking at universities, use the QS rankings. Those are the principal global academic rankings. And just to put some uh, numbers uh, to this idea of uh, a kind of higher ranking, um, Oxford and Cambridge came in the top 10 universities in the world for 34 out of 37 degree subjects in the QS rankings. They came in the top five in the world for 18 out of 37. So for half of the degree subjects um, that are applicable on the QS rankings, they come in the top five. Uh, and obviously 34 out of 37, that's nearly a full house. <laughs> so no other British universities come close to that uh, level of ranking um, across the subjects. Um, uh, it, it has to be said that, that, that some very good British universities do regularly feature in the top 10 universities in the world for specific subjects. So, for example, UCL in London, University College London, is third in the world for architecture. Um, Imperial College, fifth in the world for engineering, and LSE is fifth in the world for economics. But they don't have that same ranking across all their subjects, and that's the important um, point to make, is that the overall academic quality of education um, at Oxford and Cambridge is the highest in the UK, um, by quite a significant margin, uh, and um, one of the highest in the world. So that's, that's a really important distinction to make. Um, the, the next uh, area of difference and distinction from other British universities is the tutorial system. So the tutorial system, as its name suggests, um, for undergraduate education means that the whole process is actually predicated um, and dominated, if you like, by the relationship between the student and the tutor. Um, in terms of their academic um, and intellectual development. What does that mean in practice? That means that every student who is an undergraduate at Oxford Cambridge has a college tutor or tutors um, in the subject for which they're um, uh, studying at the university, who, with whom they, they meet on a weekly or more uh, basis. Um, maybe on a one-to-one -one basis, maybe there'll be another student present or, or, or three students present, um, they, but, but it is a very direct uh, process, um, an intensive process of education that you don't get um, at, at other British universities other than in small um, and, and quite occasional uh, basis. You certainly get seminar-based um, undergraduate education, i.e. groups of say eight to ten students. Um, you might occasionally um, you know, have a meeting with an academic tutor to discuss a certain thing, but it's not 
a um, the, the actual undergraduate system of education is not predicated on that tutorial academic relationship as it is at Oxford and Cambridge. And that, of course, the tutorial system, the one-to-one -one or two-to-one or three-to-one system of education uh, is the creme de la creme. That is the, the, the most intensive and direct form um, of undergraduate pedagogy that you can get. You are, uh, if you, in terms of the sort of nitty gritty details of it, um, a typical tutorial um, might consist of you submitting an essay uh, during the week uh, to the tutor and then you sit down for uh, let's say two hours and you justify as a student you justify what you've said in that essay um, and, and that is quite a serious level of um, uh, intensive academic and intellectual education. Um, there are there is a, a private university in the UK the New College of the Humanities um, which also does um, that sort of thing um, but no other British university um, has it as their absolute mainstay of, of undergraduate education. And therefore, in terms of the quality of educational experience, it is at the highest level. So we see that, that both the, the method um, and the quality um, of academic teaching at Oxford and Cambridge is distinct within British universities. It is at the highest level. Um, and, and, and also on a world uh, scale as well. Um, there are very few uh, universities across the world which operate the tutorial system. So what that results in, um, in terms of uh, the, the, the viewpoint of the applicant, if you like, um, is serious competition. So the competition for um, undergraduate places at Oxford and Cambridge is far higher. Um, than it is at other British universities. To put that into statistical perspective, um, the, the, the average rate of success of applicants across Oxford and Cambridge, they do differ slightly between them, but, but taking an average between them is 21%. So effectively one in five um, applicants to Oxford and Cambridge succeed. Um, by comparison, just to take a, a, um, a one of the top universities in the UK, University College London, um, the average um, rate of success in terms of applicants is 63%. So you can see that literally, statistically, it is three times harder to get into uh, Oxford and Cambridge than it is to get into some of the top universities. So that means that um, the, the, the quality of applicants is, is, is significantly higher. Um, it's absolutely no exaggeration to say that the best students in the world uh, apply to, to study at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, they, they do apply also elsewhere to, to uh, you know, particularly to places like Harvard and Yale and MIT in America. Um, but essentially, if you are um, a, a, an applicant uh, trying to gain an offer from Oxford and Cambridge, you are up against the best students of the world. Um, the, um, uh, what does that mean in sort of real terms, in terms of A-levels and, and so on and so forth? The standard offer for Oxford and Cambridge isn't actually that different um, from many other British universities. It ranges from AAA to 3A stars, but the average number of A stars that, that uh, your average Oxbridge, um, Oxford or Cambridge student has is 2.5. And um, for that, you can read three A stars and, and that there will be plenty of uh, students at Oxford Cambridge who have four, five, six A stars. So if you are going to, as a student, make a, a competitive application uh, to study at Oxford or Cambridge, you need a minimum predicted grades um, of three A stars. Uh, preferably more, uh, preferably four A stars, um, but three A stars as a minimum. We would not on the programme um, recommend that students apply unless they have that, uh, that level of academic um, uh, predicted grades, but also the consistent um, uh, evidence of performing at that level throughout year 12. But we'll come to that in a minute. Distinctness of the, um, sorry, just, sorry, <clears throat> slightly lost my voice. That's better. The final point of um, distinction is the actual application process itself. So what is, on, on top of all the other um, aspects that are distinct about it, what is distinct about the application process to Oxford and Cambridge? Well, to begin with, it is the exclusive university choice. You cannot apply um, to, to both universities. <clears throat> 
Um, that, that can create some interesting complications. Um, Oxford and University don't have identical um, degree choices. Um, they actually have uh, a number of different courses. They have courses which are similar but subtly different. So there's a lot to navigate in terms of being forced to make the choice for one or the other. It would be far easier for everybody if it was just like all the other universities and you could apply to both of them, uh, just like you can apply to UCL, LSE and Imperial, you could apply to uh, Oxford Cambridge. It is a shame that you can't, but those are the rules you cannot. So that 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 is um, a, a distinct difference uh, from other British universities, which uh, create certain particular problems and issues, as we'll see. Um, and secondly, is the the the, the admissions process at Oxford and Cambridge is managed through the colleges. It isn't managed through the departments and faculties as it would be at a normal university, at another British university, for example. So what does that actually mean? That means that representatives of the faculties or departments of the subject which a student's applying for, the senior fellows as they're called, the senior academic staff, um, at, at a college, they will make the um, assessment, which means that the, uh, an applicant has to apply to a college. Um, students can make an open application, but they will still be randomly allocated a college. Their, their application will be processed through the college. And that means that, that there are certain things that the student has to take into account in relation to that college to make a choice, which we will come to later. Um, another distinct aspect of the application process, which is different from other universities, is the pre-interview in inter interview assessment test. The pre-interview assessment test um, is a formal examination, like an A-level. You sit it in a in that kind of a context in a in, a, in an exam hall under time conditions on a certain day, um, and it is um, designed to stretch. Uh, the curricular learning. It's based on the curriculum um, of, of the A-levels, but it is that little bit harder to test the thinking and analytical skills. Um, and it's become all the more important now that AS, the AS level is not a standardized part of the A-level curriculum anymore, um, which means it can't be taken as the um, standard uh, benchmark assessment of academic ability at the end of year 12, which it used to be in the Oxford process. So um, this is perhaps a little bit more like the older um, exa entrance examination um, process that used to take place, um, and, um, and and it's very very important in the uh, the assessment process now that AS levels are no longer there. Um, other universities do operate pre-interview assessment tests. Um, they are operating them more frequently, but they are not as extensive or as formal uh, as as Oxford and Cambridge. So pre-interview assessment tests do require significant attention. Interviews. Um, this is um, the uh, an important stage of assessment. I emphasise that this is only part of the um, assessment process. I think there's a lot of misconception about the Oxford interview. It is not a do or die situation. Oxford and Cambridge are very clear about that. Applicants who don't do particularly well at interview but have done brilliantly in their pre-interview assessment tests and everything else, um, do, you know, do get in. And the reverse is true as well. Uh, so, but but the interview is an important process because it models the tutorial context. So effectively, interviews are conducted almost like kind of mini tutorials. They want to see how the student um, responds to that kind of direct dialogic form of pedagogy. And they want to see um, whether the student can really think on their feet. I think that is a, a consistent uh, uh, feature that they underline as being important. Can the student think for themselves? Um, do they have the capacity for original thinking? Can they really um, um, process the problems in front of them in an original and, and, and individual, perhaps, would be the best uh, way of saying it. Um, and um, uh, the interview, uh, obviously, sixth form students generally do not have much experience of interviews. So, you know, this is something that needs to be taken into account. Early application deadline. So to add to all the distinctness and, and difference that uh, is involved in the Oxbridge application process and as universities to apply to, 
Um, there is also an early deadline. That is three months earlier than the normal UCAS deadline. So the, um, that's the 15th of October rather than the 15th of January. What that means is applicants have to start their UCAS application, get all their decisions for the remaining other four universities um, done, their personal statements, everything else, pre-interview assessment, test preparation, you name it. Really, frankly, that has to be done before the beginning of year 13. So by the time that we start year 13, we expect um, Oxford applicants to um, have done all this. And, and this is, as we'll see, um, a big part of the programme itself. So um, um, Oxbridge applicants then really start the ball rolling in um, year 12 and, and quite early on, as we'll see. So as you can see, um, the, the, the Oxbridge application process, what's involved in it in terms of the process, but also the competition, um, and, and the nature of the universities demands a designated Oxbridge program. So what does that actually involve? That involves a 12 month program. Yes, it's a one year program, um, which, which goes from January to January every year. So um, that involves um, getting the ball rolling with students in, in uh, uh, late January. Um, after the previous round had finished. So the outcome of the previous group of Oxbridge applicants is around the 15th of January. So we make sure that all that's done and that they're okay um, and sorted out or if there's any issues to deal with that they're done. So we really begin these things sort of uh, pretty much the last week of January, uh, first week of February. Um, there is a meeting every month, sometimes more than that, um, in which there are specific task sets for uh, st students to grapple with. Um, it's cumulative, so each uh, meeting builds on the previous meeting to give students a, a sense of momentum. Uh, it's organised into a, uh, a kind of <laughs> self-selecting framework, if you like. I mean, if students don't get these certain things done, um, then really it's quite difficult for them to continue on the programme. Um, and um, it involves um, skill development in the process. We'll be looking at certain uh, uh, skills that, that, that are required. Obviously, primarily those are academic and intellectual. Um, so we're looking at how they can develop um, their uh, uh, abilities and skills in the subject for which they're applying um, and, and specifically in relation to the application and obviously more general advice and preparation that's required um, whether it be, you know in terms of the application process um, the finickety aspects um, of which we shall uh, look at in a minute. So in the beginning of the year, we look at the, so in the spring, if you like, we look at um, university and degree choice. Um, what is the tutorial system about? Which, which, which university are you gonna decide on? Have you really looked through the course structure sufficiently to understand that to, to apply to one or other of these universities is um, the right thing? A classic example of this is uh, the um, political, very popular political science courses, PPE at Oxford, um, HSPS, that's Human and Social Political Sciences at Cambridge, and um, very similar in all sorts of ways, but, um, but actually fundamentally different in others. So you really, really have to um, go through a uh, course structure, um, very important. Um, and, and also, how does that how does that course relate to your long term goals? You know, is this what you where you want to go academically and um, professionally, so on and so forth? Um, making sure that it's really good, given that you can't apply to both universities, you've got to get it right. Um, then there's the additional UCAS choices to go through. Then there is the um, how to get the best out of um, the the uh, open days at um, Oxford and Cambridge, and that that involves faculty and department open days. These things start fairly quickly. Some of them as er, uh, as early as the end of February and early March. Um, and then what are the taster sessions and masterclasses provided by um, each university department, faculty, and so on and so forth, which students can attend. And obviously, an integral integral part of that decision making is the college choice. So um, college choice is a tricky one. So um, there are all sorts of factors to consider there. You've got to consider that, that, that there may be certain clusters, as they tend to call them, which have a, around a certain academic area, which, which the student is very interested in. There may be non-academic 
clusters like, for example, you know, King's College Cambridge has got, you know, a great musical tradition. You know, is that what the student wants to be involved in? What are the resources like? You know, the, 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 the disparity in wealth and resources between the colleges is huge. You know, some colleges sit on an endowment of literally one billion pounds. Trinity College Cambridge, the infamously even, <laughs> has this huge endowment. You know, whether other, other colleges may, may have far less, you know, may have, you know, 30 million because they were founded in 1968, and not 1546. So there are lots and lots of things to consider about colleges. Um, what sort of living environment is it? And, and also how to get the best out of college open days, what to do at them, who to see, who to talk to. This is all very important in terms of making the college choice. Um, then as, 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 as we move further into um, uh, the spring term, we look at the actual application process. Um, how to map out everything in terms of the, the, the October deadline, how to navigate the college-based admission system, how to understand how that works. Um, so what's it like to submit an application um, when perhaps only three or four people are looking at it instead of 15? Um, you know, what, what, what sort of thing should you really be doing in terms of trying to make a, a really good general um, um, application in terms of, of, of the college where, where you know, there, there may not be that many people looking at it. You know, there are all sorts of things to uh, think about there. Multifactorial assessment, there are probably... Oh, I think it works out as eight major components of assessment and 16 um, overall components of assessment. You know, what are they? How does that work? Which are the most important? Um, what kind of level do uh, does the student have to achieve that in year, in year 12? What's expected of them in terms of um, uh, achievement during year 12 and at the end of year 12? How's that going to relate to predicted grades? What kind of predicted grade should they be aiming at? Obviously, that is three A stars, but it's, it, it sometimes requires a discussion if they're taking four subjects. Is that three A stars and an A or whatever it is? Um, how are they going to develop their supercurricular learning? Um, uh, which is very important in terms of if everybody's got three A stars who's applying for the same thing as you, how do you stand out in terms of your personal development in the subject that you're applying? You know, you need to be, um, you need to stand out. Um, what's the best way to prepare um, at an early stage of pre-interview assessment tests? Um, uh, uh, thinking about the interview and what's involved in that. And also considering the merits of applying before you've got your A-levels and after you've got your A-levels. So this is an important point. For example, let's say you have a student who is really in um, March is looking really like A star AA, but is moving definitely in the right direction. Then you can say, well, you could make a pre-qualification pre application like, before you've got your A-levels, but, but given that you're moving in the right direction and you're not quite there yet, why don't you wait until you get your A-levels? And then it's a lot easier because then they can see your A-levels and they can go, well, good, you've got three A-stars and you've got over 95% in all of them. Brilliant. In you come. It is a lot easier once you've got um, applications that, that are very, very clear evidence of your, your, your uh, exceptional academic ability. So there are lots of things to think about in the application process, which we go through in spring. Then as we start um, going into sort of the Easter holidays um, and the summer term, we start focusing on the personal statement, um, looking at exemplars, and maybe developing some kind of provisional working draft liaising with the subject tutor, looking at how commitment and interest might be developed a little bit more if it's slightly lacking, as with supercurricular learning, um, but also thinking about things like independent research projects. So the EPQ, the Extended Project Qualification, um, is one way of doing it. That is an externally assessed independent research project. You could do an internally assessed one, but you have to do some personal research um, and get that going, which again distinguishes your application. Likewise, work experience that can actually, particularly if you're applying for something like architecture or medicine or law, um, that could actually be a very good thing to start getting sorted in March and May. Um, then we're looking at the end of the year. Obviously, key focus is get fantastic results at the end of year 12. Um, and um, that is that that is very important, but obviously we're moving into the um the the area of preparation over the summer very important 
um, period of preparation over the summer is, is for the pre-interview assessment tests, um, looking at resources that can help you with that, liaising with subject teachers during June, obviously term ends at the end of, of May. There are some exams in June, once those, uh, sorry, at the end of May for year 12 students, once those are over, then they've got whole of June to talk to um, full-time staff um, about uh, what they should be doing in terms of pre-interview assessment or me or, or anybody else involved in helping people in the Oxbridge process, develop their skills and, and understanding what the key assessment areas are within the pre-interview assessment test very important also to use the summer to use june to liaise with teachers and with uh, uh me about um, an independent research project epq is the best it's a five thousand word independent research project started in march you completed over the summer vacation it's evidence of supercurricular learning it's externally examined so you get a predicted grade on your ucas uh, application form you um, can talk about it in your personal statement. Um, we can talk about it in our references. Um, you can talk about it in your interview. It's just a really good thing to do. So that is how the um, summer shapes up. Obviously, work experience, we talked about that a little bit already. Do it in the summer vacation. Got to be dire directly related to the degree. Uh, shows long-term professional commitment for vocational subjects, skill development. It develops um, learning on a super curricular basis. Uh, it's good for the personal statements, good for the references, good for the interview. So those are all things which we build into the um, summer vacation period um, and also the um, completion of provisional draft of the um, personal statement. By the time that I return to work in mid-August, I want to see first drafts of the personal statement and any EPQ or independent research projects completed in a provisional form. So that allows me then in, in liaison with other teachers um, to write the references, make the predicted grades. Applications are all finalized by mid-September, sent off um, in the week before the deadline. So we aim to get things sent off by the 7th rather than the 15th, just to make sure um, that everything is tidy. Um, then we advise students in terms of supplementary um, application material. So Cambridge has actually its own internal UCAS called the SAQ. Oxford has different um, processes, often quite college specific, that may involve additional written work. Then we get start moving into the pre-interview assessment test preparation and any at interview assessment preparation, because quite a lot of um, subjects have both a pre-interview assessment and an at interview assessment. Then once the application has been submitted um, and the, um, the pre-interview assessment test has been done, so just to put that in perspective, pre-interview assessment tests generally take place a month later, so sort of mid-November. Um, and then we prepare students um, for the interview. They get two practice interviews. The inter the, the inter practice interviews focus on thinking skills, dialogic skills, problem solving, extent of su supercurricular learning, their interest in the subject, how they would thrive in a tutorial system, and anything else we build in in terms of what we know about at interview assessment testing. Then there is the outcome, which comes in um, uh, January, uh, uh, mid-January, around the 15th. Um, if they got an offer, fantastic. Um, if they haven't got an offer, then we um, look into feedback. Once we process that feedback, we might consider recommending that the student reapplies. Uh, once they've got um, their A-levels, we've had plenty of students who have not got in first time and have reapplied, having got extremely good um, A-level results. Um, it also means that they've got a year of additional study, they're that bit prepared. And I think this is an important thing to make clear that it, it, it is about the extent of intellectual and academic development at, of the student at the stage that they apply. So if they're not ready um, in year 12, they might be ready at the end of year 13. So that's an important thing to remember. What are our success rates like over the five year period of the um, Oxford programme from 25 to 19? Um, we have a 34% um, success rate. That's one in three students that apply um, are successful. That is the same success rate as Eton College. Um, it's a very similar success rate to um, many of the leading um, independent schools. 
Um, and last year, I, uh, or rather, if you like, those who were, were made an offer in January of this year, who applied in 2019, it was a 50% success rate. Um, I think going by the 2018 statistics, which is all that we have, um, the there are, I think, only... I think two other schools in the UK that achieved over 50%. So that was very gratifying um, that we had um, a higher than average success rate, which um, shows that we are moving in the right direction, I hope. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I'm sure there have been a few questions which have popped up. If um, you don't uh, get an opportunity to ask your question today, or you don't feel that it has been um, adequately or sufficiently answered um, to your satisfaction, then you can write directly to me, will at ashbourncollege.co.uk. You can also contact the admissions team, Ang or Chris or, or, or whoever, or Lee or whoever, and, and ask to um, arrange to have an interview, uh, a, a, a meeting with me, a Google Meet meeting. Um, I'm around until the end of June and then back in mid-August. Thanks very much, Will. Um, yeah, so if anyone's got any questions at this point, um, please do let us know. Sorry, Adrian, can you just clarify what you were uh... What you're asking about the the PPE essay? Uh, did you mean EPQ? Yes. So I, I think he's asking about um, just the timeline in terms of completing the EPQ. Well, when when should they uh, when should they start? When should the, they be aiming to have that completed by? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the EPQ is started really in March of Year Twelve. Um. In a, in a provisional way, we don't want it to get in the way of academic study. I mean, this is the this is the this is the thing is that uh, the way that it's structured with Oxbridge applicants is different from the way that it's structured with non-Oxbridge applicants because of the three-month um, earlier de deadline. So, so what we do is you get the ball rolling with them in March, which is. Uh, earlier than you would do normally with with EPQ students and then with a mind for them to get the body of the research and writing done over the summer so that they can um, that develops their supercurricular learning in the subject for which they're applying um, it it's something that they can talk about in their personal statement um, they will be ready to talk in depth about it um, in, in interview um, so it also assists in the preparation for the um, pre-interview assessment test because it's developing their knowledge and learning. So, so, so in a way, the bulk of their work, um, in a way, on it, which is independently conducted, of course, um, is done over the summer vacation, and then they hit the ground running, and then you know, polish it off in the autumn term, and, and then it gets submitted. Um, I think finally by the EPQ coordinator, I think they wrap it all up at the end of the autumn term and then, you know, it's, 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 it's often sent off and then they get a qualification. I hope that answers your question. Um, question here from Ali, Will, uh, about how important are GCSEs uh, when applying to Oxford and Cambridge? Mm. Well, this is part of the sort of, you know, 16 component multifactorial assessment. If you have outstanding GCSEs, um, so lots of nines and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's going to help. Um, but we all know that, that students can do extremely well um, at, at GCSE and not so well at A-level. Um, so, you know, in a way it's six of one and a half dozen the other. It, it can make a difference if everything else on your application is, is fantastic. Um, but let's say you've got a fairly you know, mediocre academic record in year 12. You don't do that well in the pre-interview assessment tests. You know, even if you got all nines, that's not gonna make a difference. They want to see what stage you're at now, okay? And looking back to your GCSEs might help them, for example, contextualize something if something's gone wrong. Let's say I've said in my reference that the, the student in year 12 um, had very, you know, a very serious medical problem, which has affected their academic performance. But their GCSEs are clear indication that they are of exceptional academic caliber. That would be a point at which they would look and go, well, yes, you know, those are extreme. OK, they haven't done that well in in um, in, the, in in year 12. And perhaps that's affected their pre-interview assessment test. But they've done brilliantly in, in their GCSE. So I think the I think the best way to look at it is 
what in, in terms of the student making application is what is their current status of academic achievement and potential and and if the GCSEs help to enhance that in some way then that's useful otherwise I wouldn't dwell on it too much I would I would more dwell on what has academic performance and achievement been in year 12 what's it likely to be in year 13 I think that's key question here from Ornella Will uh, how do you apply through Ashbourne after your A-levels um, yeah that's fine I mean you know we we have um, quite a uh, <laughs> I would say a pretty extensive alumni support network you know I, I think one of my students from from five years ago came back to, to, to have a meeting with me about advising on which PhD to do I mean you know we, you know we, we just carry on um, how does it work in practice uh you know where where i mean an interesting one is to think about retakes for example let's say an ashbourne student got a star a star b um and then thought hang on a minute you know oh that just went wrong the b went wrong i'm going to retake um that subject maybe take another subject you know that would be an instance where they are actually enrolled at the school so they're just going to get the full support anyhow but if they wanted to, let's say they got three A stars, they got 95% in, in, in across the board, you know, they're, they're really, you know, potentially going to make a strong application. Yeah, then they just come back, they meet with me. They don't attend the Oxbridge programme because they've attended it and also they're not enrolled at the school, but they just come back and meet with me. It's very straightforward. They've been through the process before. They know, they know what the deal is. They know how to do it. It's, it's not very complicated. You know, post-qualification applications are not complicated, particularly for students that have already done it um, or, or, or um, uh, uh, you know, have made up their mind. I mean, if they, if they hadn't applied initially, let's say they, you know, got an offer for LSE that was an A star, A star A, but actually got, got wound up getting three A stars and fantastic. And then they say, right, I want to make an Oxbridge um, application. I mean, they've, you know, it's the same pretty much. They've been through the UCAS application procedure. They just need to sit down and in their own spare time, make sure that they're really, you know, aware of what's involved in the Oxbridge process. And I would guide them through that. Yeah, great. I would add to that as well that um, it, I think this applies not only to Oxford applications but to applications anywhere that if a student has completed their A-levels and they want to get back in contact with us and need our support we're always yeah. happy to help um, in essentially the same capacity as as it would have been had they been a student a sort of current student uh, so yeah we're always happy to help with those, yeah. those yeah, we do our alumni. extensive alumni support system really you know a Absolutely. lot of students come back to, for help one way or another yeah Great. OK, thank you for that. Um, another question here, Will, from John. He's asking, uh, can one join the course to get interview experience, even if not applying to Oxbridge? No, not no. A simple answer is no, um, because it is specifically tailored to the Oxbridge interview process. Um, but if you are a student, for, for example, who, um, uh, you know, is going to get is going to be required to attend an interview um, let's say for example um, I know that um, you know Imperial for example frequently interview their students um, then then we would just prepare you on an ad hoc basis it wouldn't be anything to do with the Oxbridge program it would just be what you would do in liaison with your UCAS tutor and a subject teacher and you would get prepared <laughs> there's no way that you would not get support um, for for an interview outside of Oxbridge sister you would just get that as a matter of course from your UCAS tutor in, in liaison with the uh, your subject teacher for the subject that you're applying for. Uh, question here from Marwan. Will what are our year 12 predicted grades based on? Uh, let's 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 rephrase the 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 kind of uh, the question in a way um, what is it in year 12 that that sort of contributes to um uh, uh the predicted grades as it as it sort of as the as it extends into year 13 so remember that that you know there is there is whatever it is five weeks before the 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 application deadline in year 13 as well and there's the whole summer vacation as well so you're not just talking about year 12, you're talking about year 12 transition to year 13 and a tiny little bit of year 13 as well. So there's everything that there is up to that date of submission of the application. 
So um, year 13, what we're looking for is, is sorry, in year 12, what we're looking for is consistent, outstanding achievement at the A star level. A star default is 90%. So if you're getting 90% in the majority of your assignments and mocks in year 12, there we go. That, that's an A star, isn't it? How easy is it to predict someone an A star? It's very easy if they've achieved at that level. So ideally, that's what we were looking at. And we were looking at that, that performance throughout the year, then being finalized in the end of year examinations as well. But let's say that it hasn't quite been like that. Let's say it's been more like 80 to 90. Um, or even let's say it started off at 75, but it started going to 80. And then, you know, that there is a pattern of improvement over year 12. Then that shows that you are heading towards an A star grade. That, that means there's perhaps less to talk about in your reference, um, um, but in terms of your achievement in year 12, um, but it shows you're going in the right direction. Remember that the predicted grades are predictions based on what you are likely to achieve in the summer of the following year. Okay, so that's a long way away. Um, that is, you know, that's 10 months away from when the, the application is submitted. So, you know, as, as long as there is a very convincing trajectory towards an A star, um, then, you know, then that, that, that's, that's fair enough. And, 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 you know, look, you know, uh, students improve. Students get better at A levels um, as they go on. So, you know, we take that into account. Question here, Will, from Nafeli asking, do the Ashbourne staff members lead you through this process of application if you wish to apply to an Oxbridge University? Do other Oxbridge staff, so other people apart from me. Ashbourne, Ashbourne staff, yeah. Do other Ashbourne staff, yes. So um, as we've progressed on the Oxbridge programme, um, more and more members of staff at Ashbourne have become involved. I'm the principal coordinator, but there's lots and lots of other people who get involved in advising students. I think this... <laughs> This is probably one of the reasons why we appear to be getting a higher success rate than some of the bigger schools um, is because we've got smaller numbers um, of students at the college. You know, that the student to staff ratio is very high. Um, sorry, the staff to student ratio is very high. So um, that means that you're, you're getting a lot of time, from not, not just the coordinator, me, um, but you're also going to get a lot of time from your subject teachers you're going to get advice from um, the principal and and director of studies you know you're going to get a lot of people who who are helping you to succeed absolutely and, and the more that you more that students are proactive about that the, the better but i mean the the obvious one is that you get you get you get a lot of support from your subject teacher because that's the person you let's say you're studying, you're, you want to apply for economics and you're going to take the economics pre-interview assessment test at Cambridge. You're going to want to go through that specification for that test with your your subject teacher and say, look, you know, I don't understand what, you know, this formula means. Can you help me? You know, and um, that could be literally that could be a, you know, two minute email, couldn't it? It could be a one minute conversation where they just go, well, Actually, you know, look at this, look at this book, look at this online resource. Yeah, everybody gets involved. Of course they do. Of course they do. Well, a question here from Emma. She's asking, I did not do GCSE. Does that make a difference to my application? So I assume she means that she took a different system uh, than the GCSE system. Doesn't make any difference. I mean, you know, um, Oxford and Cambridge have huge numbers of uh, uh, applicants out from outside Britain. Um, and they obviously uh, they want the best students in the world so it has no bearing what system uh, of, of um, you know year 11 exams that, that, that are taken as long as the results are very good and it's it's their job the college's uh, you know uh, job to understand what those things mean um and what they mean in terms of their their relationship with a level performance and so on and so forth so no you know it, it's absolutely in their interests to accept uh, applications of people who have not done gcses otherwise they're limiting the quality of applicants another question here will from basira she's asking are epqs common and does not completing an epq put you at a disadvantage for for applying to oxbridge no the key no not at all the key the key thing 
I mean, Oxford Cambridge is very clear about this, that that um, they they won't make an offer based on on the EPQ. Okay, so if they if they determine, you know, some some universities do, um, you know, they'll they'll lower their grade offer and and give, let's say, you know, instead of A star AA, they'll say AAA plus get an A and EPQ. Now, Oxford Cambridge don't do that. What, but, but, but what Oxford Cambridge do say is that independent research projects, you know, are very clear evidence of supercurricular de development and learning and interest in the subject. And that is obviously significant and, and attractive in an application. A a any, any evidence that that student is, is, is really totally fascinated in, by their subject and wants to do lots of their own research beyond and above what they're doing in their A-level, obviously that is going to be attracted to them. What they want is people who love the subject effectively, you know, as much as them, if you like, um, want to spend all day every day doing that subject and will go on to get first in it. That's what they want. Of course they want that. So any evidence of, of a student who really loves their subject and has just gone way beyond their curriculum because they love that subject so much and they've done all sorts of things, research projects, attended lectures, read books, blah, blah, blah. That's what they want. So it's not the EPQ is just a sort of focal point of that. What we would call that is supercurricular development. So anything that is evidence of supercurricular development is good. The EPQ is great because it's structured, it's it's a whopper, it's 5,000 words. You know, most students don't write essays of over 1,000 words at sixth form. That shows a lot of commitment and a lot of um, academic ability and research ability, you know, the kind of abilities that you're going to be required to be a you know, really good undergraduate. So, yeah, EPQ makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't have to be that. Marwan's asking about the, the time windows to submit your Oxbridge application. Yeah. Well, well, um, he, he's, he's asking when those are, I think, just to clarify the October, deadlines and time frame. Deadline October the 15th. OK, so you, you, you can submit it before that. Most students don't um, because they want to improve their personal statement right up to the last minute. Our cutoff in the Oxbridge programme is the 7th. I want to see all the applications off by then, just in case there are any little bits that are hanging over or someone's forgotten a transcript or hasn't done this or whatever but that, that that's an internal deadline but, but the actual deadline is the 15 yeah so just to clarify in terms of the overall time scale you submit in the um by 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 october the 15th is a deadline Th then you would be um, um filling out um internal the internal um sort of ucas like the saq or any other requirements that the college or the university requires you would then sit a pre-interview assessment test in mid-november or thereabouts then you would have an interview around mid-december or slightly before um then you would have an outcome on january the 15th or thereabouts Great. Uh, and a question here from, from Josh Well. He's saying, what about the impact of COVID-19 restrictions on students this year? I assume, Josh, you mean, uh, has there been any sort of disruption to Oxford and Cambridge's admissions policy? I, I assume that's what you mean, but do correct me if I'm wrong. No. Uh, and, and, and because it's a pandemic and affects all students, uh, you know, obviously, you know, some countries have been um, more badly affected than others. Um, but Cambridge, Oxford and Cambridge will be sensitive to individual situations. Um, you know, in, in the worst cases, um, in terms of, um, you know, family tragedies, as it were, clearly that's taken very seriously. And Oxford and Cambridge take into account um mitigating and extenuating circumstances very seriously they take that into account what they want ultimately is they want the best academic students that there are out there in the world if that student has gone through a a particularly bad set of circumstances which are related to to covid19 um uh, and the coronavirus pandemic that will be taken into account as long as there is good evidence that can be provided because obviously they have to be fair they have to see very concrete evidence of that that is all material that you would just submit um, that would be mentioned in your reference um, that would then be um, submitted to the individual college after the uh, uh, application deadline 
um, uh, or conceivably actually before it, it, you know, so that they've got it at the time they receive your application, but you would you would know about all that. We would find out about that. Um, and they take it very seriously. Of course they do. Yeah, of course. So obviously with that situation, it varies, doesn't it, from family to family, from individual to individual. But it's no different from any other year where they take people's individual circumstances that are our extenuating and mitigating very seriously in terms of, of, of understanding the, 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 uh, the applicant in the context of that. Next question is from Basira. Well, she's asking, can a student get A stars in year 12 or is the highest grade an A in that year, DG for AS exams? Well, if they take an AS, then, then yeah, yes. I mean, essentially in year 12, um, in terms of the way that Ashbourne grades students, is that um, they they are that they are awarded in line with the AS, i.e., there is no A star, but but ninety percent is an A star. <laughs> Do you see what I mean in terms of the A level? So in terms of uh, um, how uh, Oxford and Cambridge might look at, for example, an end of year twelve result. Or, or an AS level result is it might be an A, but they will look at the percentage and go, well, it's over 90%. So that reads A star, doesn't it? Last question here was from Ali, who's asking, uh, will Oxford dislike if a student resits any exams? And will they take into account that some students got predicted grades because the exams got cancelled this year and they felt resitting the exams will give them a better result? Yeah, uh, and he's asking that if a student, as a result of the cancelled exams this year, was to then resit in the September October round that was proposed, would Oxbridge look disfavourably on that? Well, they wouldn't be look disfavourably on it if they got fantastic grades in those resits. Um, let's say you, you you took your your A levels in two thousand and twenty, <laughs> and you went off and you to do. Uh, geography a university then you decided that you didn't want to do geography and you went back to college and you did a load of new a levels or you resat ones that you previously done to get a better grade i mean it doesn't really make any difference at all what 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 they want to see is you are at an a, a sufficiently high academic level to thrive in the course if you had a rubbish year in year 13 because you had a, a, a medical complaint or you had a set of circumstances which affected your grade or you just didn't do enough work. Uh, you know, there's no reason why you can't then get yourself up to the right academic level to join as an undergraduate at Oxford or Cambridge. And if you can demonstrate that by getting an outstanding grade in your in your A-levels by resitting them, fine. If you mean individual retakes, so let's say you get A star, A star, A, and you retake the A, that is slightly different because you've got all the time in the world to focus on that resit. What normally happens in that, that situation is the, the college that you apply to, you contact the college and you say, now look, this is the situation, what do you advise? And they say, well, Normally what they say is, well, re resit it because you only got an A in it and you're going to need an A star. Let's say if you wanted to do physics and you only got an A in further maths or something and you need an A star. So you're going to say, do do that and, and actually do another subject as well because otherwise it's sort of, you're only doing one subject, you've got all the time in the world to focus on it. Not not that fair. Um, so, so resits have different elements to them in that regard i hope that that's a slightly <laughs> slightly ambiguous answer but but i hope that you can see that there are different ways of looking at it yeah yeah well he, he's just clarified here saying that he was uh, referring to gcse's um so i, I think in yeah in particular um i i think the the focus on the, the fact that the exams themselves have been cancelled this year uh, yeah. and that if a student is retaking because they were unhappy with their center assessment grades I mean, GC, again, GCSEs, you know, they have a slightly debatable role in the whole Oxbridge application process anyhow. So I, I, in other words, I wouldn't worry about it. I wouldn't worry about it. Just get on and, and get as good grades as you can in GCSEs and, and crack on with year 12.
Okay. Thank you, Ali. And thank you for all of those questions uh, to everyone that posted them. Uh, I think we're just coming up to one o'clock now. So um, I think it's a good good time to wrap things up. But yeah. thank you very much, Will, for that. Um, very informative. Uh, and it seems like a lot of people have been given a good insight into the, the support offered at Ashbourne. Uh, so I appreciate it. Yeah. And please, obviously, please do get in touch with me, um, you know, either directly and by email, um, you know, will at ashbourncollege.co.uk. Um, likewise, you know, get in touch with Chris or the admissions team or, or you know, whoever to arrange a, a Google Meet meeting with me. Uh, thanks, everyone. We'll leave it there. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us. Take care and have a good afternoon. Bye.